Good morning and welcome for, to those who are joining us online today for worship. For those who don't know me, I am Vicar Alex. And obviously Pastor Joe isn't here. He's gone this weekend, but he's not if you're online. But you have me for the sermon. So today in my sermon, I'm going to take a look at our Deuteronomy text and see how it connects to our Luke text today, where Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, you must hate father, mother, wife, and child. And see, I'm hopefully going to kind of shed some light on that and what that all means in light of the gospel. So for those online, don't forget to register your online worship with us today with this QR code that's magically going to appear right above my hands. So make sure you register your worship so that we know you are in attendance online and we will begin our worship and prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read responsibly Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff 
that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We continue with our confession and forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And hear the good news of our loving Heavenly Father, for he indeed has had mercy upon us and has sent his Son, Jesus, to die for us. So in the stead and by the command of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone The Old Testament reading for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. 
you shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from the book of Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he may serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter, Glory to you, O Lord. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate, whether he is able with ten thousand, to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
Good morning, kids. Vicar Alex here. Now today I want to talk to you about God providing his people with manna and quail in the desert. Now do you have a favorite food? I'm guessing you do. But I'm also guessing it's probably not manna and it's probably not quail. But nonetheless, let's jump into our, our lesson today, right? So Moses led the people out of Egypt, as we've talked about, and he led them across the Red Sea. And now that they're in the desert, right, there's not a whole lot to drink and a whole lot to eat in the desert, but God still provided for his people. He provided water for them, and he also provided food for them, right? Manna, which is bread from heaven, and quail. And he provided everyone with enough food so that they were full every day, right? And the people didn't necessarily always trust that God would provide, right? And they grumbled against Moses, and they even grumbled against God. But he still provided food for them. You see, does God provide food for us? And he does, right? Now, he doesn't necessarily bring manna from heaven, right? And he doesn't, uh, he doesn't bring down quail for us to collect in the morning. But God provides us with food, right? God provides farmers who grow their food, who grow our food, right? And God also provides places where we can go and, and get food also, right? And so, does God want us to trust in him to provide for our every need? Yes, right? God wants us not only to trust in him for our food, but also for our every need. So, when do we pray that God would provide us for our needs? Well, we have a great template and example, right? The Lord's Prayer, right? In the Lord's Prayer, we pray that God would provide for our daily bread, right? And our daily bread is not only the bread we might eat, but also everything that we need in this life, right? For both our body and our soul, right? God provides for our bodies and our souls, and He gives us nourishment for body and soul. All right. So let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. The basis of my sermon is all three readings, but especially these words from our Old Testament reading. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your children may live. 
Our gospel reading today is one of those readings you find in a lectionary that can be a bit confusing and hard to understand, even for those who know their Bible real well and study God's Word. So that's why I've decided to focus on the Old Testament, right? It's a self-writing sermon. I set before you life and death. Choose life, right? There's law and then there's gospel. It's a good Lutheran sermon, right? And you confirmands can thank me for those easy sermon notes. Now, actually, what I would say is that in light of what the Old Testament is saying, what Jesus says in our gospel makes actually a whole lot more sense. See, I'll state the obvious of what some of you might be thinking. Doesn't there seem to be a large contradiction in what Jesus is saying, right? Doesn't the fourth commandment teach that we should honor and love and honor our parents? So why would Jesus say that we must hate our father and mother if we are to be his disciple? See, if we look at that word for hate in the Greek that Luke uses, you can't use it any other way, right? We can't, you can't even argue, well, you know, in the Greek, Jesus actually means this in this context. No, right? Jesus means hate when he says hate. And to make it even more confusing, Jesus is saying we have to hate ourselves. You see, Jesus is giving no room for excuses in our gospel reading today. We have to hate ourselves. Think about that for a moment. Now, I can't speak to anyone in our congregation, neither can I speak to those who are watching online about whether or not you hate yourself, but I certainly can speak for myself. See, if I'm being honest, if I had to choose one Bible verse that describes me as a Christian and why I should hate myself, it would be this one. Here Paul says, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Having looked at that Romans passage, right, I hate the fact that I can point to situations in my life where I've done, said and done the wrong things despite knowing what the right thing to do was, right? Despite knowing what God's word would have me to do, right? And the biggest enemy I often face is my own self, my own sinful wants and desires. Because if I'm going to point a finger at an enemy that is going to lead to my own destruction, the surest place I can point a finger is at myself. I am my own worst enemy when it comes to my sin. And I hate that. And I also hate that sometimes I have to decide between what is right and the feelings of those that I love and care about. And that's what our Lord is talking about today in our gospel reading. And it also connects to what Moses is saying in our Deuteronomy reading. Right? At some point, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to serve the Lord or something else. And see, that's what Moses is telling the people of Israel in the Deuteronomy reading. See, they're preparing to go into the promised land. Moses isn't going to be making that journey. So in our Deuteronomy reading, this is kind of a sum of his last words or his final words to the whole assembly of Israel before they go into the promised land. It'd be a whole lot like if Pastor Joe was going to retire and right before he rode off into the sunset towards Wisconsin or Minnesota or wherever he plans to, to build his retirement mansion, right? He tells everyone at St. Stephen, Today I, the Lord has set before you life and death, or life and good, death and evil. Choose life. Now, if he said that, probably most of you would probably stand there and go, well, yeah, pastor, of course we're going to choose life, not death, right? Because it really shouldn't be a hard choice. And yet, the Lord says, I set before you life and death. Which one are you going to pick? And the Lord implores his people through Moses, choose life. Choose life. Worship the Lord your God. Walk in the way of the Lord. And you and your children will live. It shouldn't be a hard decision, right? Logically. Yet, even we make it a hard decision with the really bad choices we make partly because we put so many priorities in front of the Lord, right? 
not daring to hate that which would keep us from the Lord and his blessing. You see, in the world today, we as a people are the richest and most abundantly blessed people that has ever lived on this earth, right? We have more food. We are better educated. We have a higher standard of living. We have more money. We have more about more of every resource than, than any other nation or people that has ever lived on the face of the earth. And yet with this abundance that we have, we are also the most drugged and the most anxious society in the history of the world. Because abundance can lead to a whole lot of things, right? It can lead and open the doors to a vast array of opportunities, some good, some bad, right? but it can never lead to true joy and true clarity. And in some times, in, in fact, in times it can lead to somebody casting their own shackles and it can lead to people's own demise. You see, I've seen this in my own life and maybe you've seen this in your own life too, right? I know a few people who seem to live for every Wednesday night, right? Every Wednesday night when the lottery gets revealed, if I can just hit this lottery this week, everything's going to be better for me, right? All my problems will go away if I just hit these winning numbers. And it's not just adults, if we're being honest, right? I've seen this in the lives of children and in the lives of family, right? My son, right? He's got to go to practice five days a week in tournaments, right? Or on the weekends, and it goes all year long, because if he doesn't get the opportunity to play in high school, then how on earth is he going to get to college, right? This is our one lottery ticket as a family, right? Right, if he can make it, then our future as a family will be bright. You see, families put so many priorities in their lives in front of the Lord, right? And they say, well, we can't come to this event this week at church, or we can't make it to confirmation this week, pastor, right? We have, we have tournament going on. There's basketball practice. There's basketball tournaments or it's dance practice or it's dance competitions or, what, or whatever have you, right? My kids have practice five days a week and on the weekends, right, it's busy. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole, what, what, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul. Well, guess what? We can throw out the whole world, right? Let's replace it with an extra hour of sleep on Sunday or a basketball game or the Chiefs game or the Royals game, right? Now, I'm not saying, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that sports or an extracurricular activities are a bad thing for our children. You know, I'll be the first one to say they're a great thing, right? They're needed. But as parents... Right? What are we teaching our children when we put priorities in front of the Lord? See, we're teaching them that the Lord is never going to be a priority. Right? Everything else can come first because in the end, right, the Lord will be there when, when you're ready. Or they make up some other excuse like, well, the church is always going to be there, right? And the church is so loving, right? But they never... Put the Lord first. They never make him a priority because everything else comes first. So is it really a shock when the numbers tell us, when the data tells us that this generation which is growing up and becoming adults is the least faithful, the least reverent, and the least likely to go to church of any generation in the history of the United States? It's because that's what they've been taught by their parents, whether their parents intended it or not. And it's not just people with kids, right? We do this with so many different activities and priorities in our life, right? We don't make the Lord our first priority because maybe because we just think, well, he'll be there. And for that reason, we can put everything in front of the Lord. See, when we have that kind of attitude, We can't be disciples of the Lord, right? Because the Lord doesn't, the Lord isn't our priority, right? When we have that 
attitude, right? Lord just becomes a friend, somebody you have to visit once in a while, right? And what our Lord is saying in our gospel reading today is we need to learn to hate that. Because you know the outcome of everything that you put in front of the Lord? Now, I've said this in a few sermons already, but I'll say it again. Everything you put in front of the Lord ends in death, right? The Lord says, today I set before you life and death. And yet, once again, we hear Moses implore us, choose life. You see, if we really love mother and father, if we really love wife and children, then we wouldn't want the last time we say goodbye to them to be forever. See, if we really care about the ones we love, then we have to get our priorities straight. We should hate everything, everything that would drag them away from the Lord and his promises, right? And that's why the words that, that Moses said in our Deuteronomy reading are still relevant even 3,500 years after Moses spoke them. You see, you've been given a gift, a wonderful gift, a gift that not only trans transforms you, but it shapes your very identity, right? The gospel, it shapes your very identity, and we should do everything in our power to flee from those things that would tear us away from that gift. The book of Philemon is a great example of how the gospel is such a wonderful gift and how the gospel transforms us and changes our, our, our entire identity. Excuse me. And in fact, today, for those online, you read pretty much the entire book of Philemon today. See, we read 21 out of the 25 verses that make up that entire book. And I, I'll be honest, I love Philemon. And I wish we got to hear it in church more than just once every three years. You see, because in the book of Philemon, Philemon is a slave, was a slave owner, and he had a rotten, no good slave named Onesimus. You see, you want to know how bad a slave Onesimus was? Onesimus literally translates to useless. I mean, how bad of a slave do you have to be to be called, give or rather, to be given the name useless, right? And Onesimus runs away from Philemon, probably got drunk or stole something. And anyway, he ends up in jail with St. Paul. And St. Paul in jail preaches the gospel to Onesimus. And by a miracle of the Holy Spirit, Onesimus believes him. And so it happens, and it so happens that St. Paul is friends with Philemon, the one who Onesimus ran away from. Now, probably St. Paul ran into Philemon, or rather ran into him sometime during one of his missionary journeys. And Philemon probably heard Paul preach and helped Paul start a church in his home. Because back then, you wouldn't meet in a building right for church. The church back in, the, in that day met in people's homes. And so Philemon was a wealthy man. We know this. And he had, he had slaves, but he also had a large home that people could gather in. And so most likely, Paul started a church in Philemon's home. And so, Paul, like I said, Paul is friends with Philemon. And so, Paul, having preached the gospel to Onesimus, sends Onesimus back to Philemon. Now, this would have been a sure death sentence for Onesimus, seeing that Philemon legally would have been obligated to kill any one of his runaway slaves. But Paul sends Onesimus back anyway. And he writes, and he sends Onesimus back with this letter we, wrote, we read today in church. Right? He writes saying, the one that was once useless to you has become my very heart. You see, the gospel not only transforms, transformed who Onesimus was, right? It changed his very identity, right? It made him something wonderful, right? It gave him a new identity. 
And so let's take a look at verses 15 and 16 right here. This really emphasizes Onesimus' new identity in the gospel. For perhaps this is why he parted from you for a while, says Paul, that you, Philemon, might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, and especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. See, the gospel, the gospel, it transforms everything. It gives life where there is no life. It gives meaning where there is no meaning. Hope where there is no hope. It brings freedom from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Freedom from anxieties that our culture has no solution for other than to drug out of existence. The gospel, it gives Christ, and it gives life. Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon and tells him, I want you to love him and enjoy him as I have. Why? Because everything has changed. Hate that was, that was once there, but love him now as I love him, because now you have him forever in Christ. The gospel, it changes everything it transforms everything, not only in the life of Onesimus, but in our lives too. And it gives us new identity. We need to hate everything that would keep it from transforming our lives and those we love. You see, when we start embracing the death of the world, rather than living in the light and life of Christ, we miss the opportunity to embrace the depth of the love of Jesus. That gift of life, salvation, and forgiveness of sins. Because that gift cannot be measured against anything that the world has to offer to you. You see, we have a gift. You have a gift that transforms you and changes you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace which surpasses all understanding Guard and keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith until life everlasting. Amen. We continue our worship by returning to our Lord a portion of the gifts he has blessed us with and entrusted to us for his kingdom work. We have several giving options for you to utilize. As St. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an extraction. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all contentment in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. This week's Team Jesus Announcements. Today, September 4th, is the last day to register for this year's Women's Retreat. We hope all of our women can join us for this year's retreat, October 1st and 2nd. Also, our Small Saints Preschool program is looking for some members to help with their annual back-to-school welcome picnic this Thursday, September 8th at 6 p.m. Please sign up to help by going to the link in the Team Jesus News or by calling the church office. Next, Terry Gertz from the LCMS Foundation will be here for a meet and greet during services on Sunday, September 11th. Terry Gertz works with individuals in our congregation who want to transfer the blessings God has given them to their family and the ministries they love. Terry's services are provided at no cost to congregational members. Next, Vicar Alex is starting up a men's group here at St. Stephen. The goal of this group is to provide the men of the congregation the opportunity to fellowship in order that to grow in friendship with one another, participate in service opportunities, and to encourage each other in Christian faith and life. The men's group will meet every fourth Saturday of the month, excluding December. 
The first meeting will be September 24th at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. So, men of the congregation, mark your calendars and join us. Finally, our annual Community Work Day is just two weeks away on Sunday, September 18th. If you've already volunteered to help build beds, a waiver to use the tools provided by Sleep in Heavenly Peace needs to be completed prior to the workday by each adult, and for minors, that can be completed by their parents. To do so, check out the QR code in the Team Jesus News. That's also where you can find more information about everything that's happening here at St. Stephen. At this time, we make confession of our Christian faith to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This week in prayer, we're going to remember George Hauser, who continues his battle with cancer, Rick Strack, who is recovering, Chuck Bennett, who is having surgery on Monday, Virginia, who is Barb Baker's friend, who has stomach cancer, and Sue Dickerson, who is starting rehab. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, Empower your church to be obedient to the following the great commission of making disciples. Pour out your spirit upon us so that we are better equipped to share the hope of Jesus we have with others. Open doors to our top town lists so we have opportunities to share our hope in Jesus. We also ask your guidance in our ministry clarity process so that Team Jesus is united in our purpose of bringing and growing people in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, guide the leaders of this world, and especially our our nation. Grant peace and justice for all people, so that your gospel may be heard in all nations. Watch over those who serve in our armed forces, law enforcement, and first responders. Send your angels to guard and care for them, and bring them home safely to their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protecting Father, look with mercy on the sick, injured and recovering, including George, Rick, Chuck, Virginia, and Sue. If it be your will, give them healing, restoration, and strength. Heavenly Father, sustain and comfort those who mourn the death of loved ones. Comfort them by your Holy Spirit with the hope 
that only you can bring. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of life, you called us to be your own through the power of baptism. Help us daily to remember you have made us your children in baptism. We celebrate with Ella, Linda, and Jim as they celebrate their baptismal birthdays. Keep them and all of us in your baptismal promises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, loving Father, who instituted, ordered, and blessed the estate of marriage between a man and a woman, we give you thanks and praise for this most precious gift. You care deeply about marriage and have promised to be the cord that binds marriage together. We rejoice with Roger and Laura as they celebrate a wedding anniversary. Continue to bless and strengthen them and all our marriages. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, Continue to shower blessings upon our Small Saints program as we begin a new school year. Grant wisdom to Beth and our teachers as they manage and teach these precious little ones. Send your angels to watch over the students and their families to keep them safe throughout the school year. And give to all our members a heart and desire to support our outreach efforts to those families so that they learn of your great love for them and Jesus. Help us to be your hands and feet as we serve these families that you have brought us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your promises. And all of God's people said, Amen. We complete our trek through the Lord's Prayer, petition by petition, beginning with the seventh petition and the conclusion. So what is the seventh petition? but deliver us from evil. What does this mean? We pray in this petition, in summary, that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil of body and soul, possessions and reputation, and finally, when our last hour comes, give us a blessed end, and graciously take us from this valley of sorrows to himself in heaven. What is the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer? For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. What does this mean? This means that I should be certain that these petitions are pleasing to our Father in heaven, and are heard by him, for he himself has commanded us to pray in this way, and has promised to hear us, Amen, Amen means yes, yes, it shall be so. Now receive the benediction of our Lord, the Almighty and gracious Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bless and preserve us. Amen. Amen.